Are you serious? Hello, this is How to Kill an Hour. My name is Marcus Bronzy. There's plenty of ways to kill some time out there. Thank you in advance for killing some time with us. Got a very special episode. Oh, well, how rude of me. I'm also joined by you, producer Bill. How you doing, man? Not too bad, mate. You're not too bad. You good? I'm good, thank you very much. I'm currently in a makeshift studio because this interview came through literally hours ago. So uh, I'm, I was in between studios with no kit. So I'll be honest with you, Bill, I've been running around London um, actually driving a car that um, I'm trying out but I think we'll save the review of that for the next episode because we've got a few things we want to talk about before we get our very special sci-fi guest on today's show um, God, we've been killing time doing quite a few things here what, what should we talk about today, Bill? Should we get into some tech? A uh, bit of tech, a bit of entertainment stuff um, I understand you went to a drive-in secret cinema which is very different to how secret cinema usually do their, their gigs yeah, man. So Secret Cinema is like an interactive, experiential company who have been doing, for, for as long as we've been around at How to Kill Now, they've been kind of at the forefront or one of the forefront companies when it comes to making experiences that you can go and take part of that are themed. And their thing is they theme it around film. So for example, we've done a, uh, what have we done in the past? We've done quite a few, haven't we? We've done a Stranger Things Stranger one. Stranger Things. Uh, we have done. Ooh, 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 ooh. What is it? Why has it slipped my mind? Blade Runner. Of, that's it. Blade Runner. Only like one of the most classic sci-fi films out there. Did a Blade Runner experience, and they're really, really good. So now that the kind of social distancing has kicked in as a thing, uh, obviously companies have had to adjust, and Secret Cinema have managed to keep their theatrical theme when it comes to cinema stuff, but help us socially distance. So they set up a secret cinema driving cinema experience at, at Goodwood. So I drove down to Goodwood next to the racetrack. So you can actually see cars like zinging around and decided to watch the big, fully grown adult movie that was Toy Story 1. <laughs> the original Toy Story is like 25 years ago, old. Um, and it was really nice. It's, uh, it was a really nice experience in terms of just being able to drive in quite easily. Your car gets given a, a, a place uh, basically based on its size. If it's a smaller car, I think they put you close to the front. If you're a bigger car, they put you close to the back. So there's not like, you know, in the cinema, somebody with a big Afro like me isn't blocking your line of sight, Bill. Uh, and you kind of have a lot of space to uh, chill and have your car. Um, and then when you're there, because I'm not organized, I didn't organize any food. I didn't organize any drinks. I was like, let me just get there and I'll sort something out. You can actually order food and drinks from an app, from the website, should I say, uh, for Secret Cinema, and they bring the food over to you. So I got there, not late on time, I asked for some snacks, uh, they got delivered to me, and the film kicked off, got myself a little burger, yeah, got myself a little cerveza, as they say in Spain, aka a beer, just the one though, because obviously man was driving, kicked back and watched Toy Story. And before that, they actually had a DJ that was playing tunes and interacting with the crowd. There was a Zoom experience that you can actually log into a Zoom, kind of like me and Billy are using now. You can jump onto Zoom, have a chat, and then basically, no, jump onto Zoom and show yourself to the audience. They can see you on the big screen. Um, be like, hey, like wave to yourself at the audience. So that was pretty cool. People are dressed up. Some of what was cool, there were people in cosplay. I don't even think they were like adults, young people in cosplay. So had a little cosplay competition. And then the film kicked off. And it was my first drive through cinema experience here in the UK. And it was nice to get in, easy to get in. The film was obviously a classic Toy Story. And I got out again. Really, really enjoyed it, Bill. Um, I will say this though, when you're going to a cinema, if you can, a drive through cinema, remember when you park up, you do not turn your car on or you leave it on during the, the film because obviously it's bad for the environment. So if it's a hot day, yeah, <laughs> basically make sure you're not wearing a lot of clothes, like make sure you're ready to wind the windows down. And what I did actually is I brought a blanket that I put over my window to the right hand side because that's where the, the sun was and I didn't get like cooked from the inside when I was sitting in the car. Um, so maybe if it's like a super hot summer's day and you're booking last minute, maybe you might, for my, personally, for my opinion, like I wouldn't want to sit in my car like during the hottest day. So I might go for an evening slot or I might wait for a slightly cooler week before I go there personally. Do you know what I mean? No one else seems to complain, but you know what I mean? I just like, I don't want to be like cooked in my car whilst I'm watching a film. But it's the UK, so no doubt we're not going to have super heat waves for all this time. So yeah, that was one of the things I'll do, Bill. Sounds interesting. Sounds interesting. Maybe I'll give it a go myself. Yeah, man. Plus, obviously, check this. You're in your own car. 
yeah? You're in your own car and you chill. And here's a bit of tech actually, which is pretty cool. I wasn't sure how they were going to get sound to us. I thought, are we going to have to log into a radio station? And like, you know, that's how we're going to get the audio. They give I mean, you these that's cool, how it's usually done. That's what I thought, but they got these really cool JBL speakers and they were plugged into a sound system and they like cleaned them down for us, obviously, COVID safe, popped them to us and you can pop it on your dashboard in the car and chill. So you can turn down the movie or turn it up. It's really, really cool, man. Super chilled. Uh, what would you watch if you went to a drive through cinema, Bill? Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe a Die Hard or something like that. Yeah. I think they've got classics on like that. So it's not just, yeah, check it out. It's not just new stuff. It's not just like super old kiddie stuff. It's like they've got a whole range of things. So yeah, Die Hard. I think that's actually on, you know. That's actually on. In fact, yeah, go on. Let's have a look at some listings now. Let me have a look at some listings and share that with you. Secret Cinema. Hagen Dazs presents. The drive through experience. Let me just give you a list of the kind of range of films that they've got there. Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, American Psycho, Beauty and the Beast, The Greatest Showman, Deadpool, Frozen, Bohemian Rhapsody, The Empire Strikes Back, and more. Uh, so yeah, check that out. That's the future of the cinema, Bill. If you're lipsing up people at the cinema now, you're going to have to do it in the backseat of your car. <laughs> Anyway, I've told you all about Secret Cinema, which has got a bunch of sci-fi films on to watch as well, which leads very nicely into our next guest, Mike McMahon, the gentleman who is responsible for bringing us the first animated Star Trek series for a very long time. It's called Lower Decks. And look, we got a very finite amount of time with him. So the first thing I wanted to ask Mike when he came on the show was, what's your first Trek memory? Um, I remember watching uh, TNG with my mom. I was born in 81, so I was like right in the pocket to watch a ton of 90s Trek when I was old enough to watch it. And uh, my very, very first memory, I know that this can't be right, but I remember Jordy yelling and being in a tree. And I think I've like mixed up a couple things. It might be like, you know, people would hang out in trees in the holodeck or something. But, but for some reason, I remember like, seeing this guy in this cool visor and being like, oh yeah, this is, a, this is my show. <laughs> like, I like this show. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And so, so you are a, a TNG baby. That's what we sometimes call them. That's what I call them. So you're somebody who TNG was your first kind of contact with the, contact with the Trek universe. So at what point did you decide to kind of get more into it? Did you, did you do more in the next generation or did you decide to go back and kind of take in the originals? episodes I, I kind of i'm interested to what, what the way you consumed star trek um at first i was all whenever tng was on i was watching it because that right. was back before we didn't have the vhs's or any of that kind of stuff so like you know a lot of the times i'd be jumping into a tng episode and i hadn't seen you know the first 15 minutes because i didn't catch it exactly at the right time because i was a kid so half the episode would be me being like what is going on in this episode <laughs> um Although one of my friends uh, must have had really trekky parents. I remember that she had a bunch of the animated series VHSs. And I think when I was a kid, I thought that that was the original Star Trek. Like I didn't know TOS existed. And I thought it went from the animated series to uh, TNG. Mm -hmm. um, I caught up pretty quick though, because I used to go to uh, the last couple uh, TOS movies that they made. I remember I saw Undiscovered Country in theaters uh, with my folks and it just blew me away. Like I was like, oh, right, this is the best thing. Like Star Trek is the best thing. Um, and then obviously like Generations and oh, First Contact might be my favorite. Like just absolutely what a banger of a movie. I love that movie. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I actually got into, I watched Voyager Live. Deep Space Nine, I think I was too young for it seemed okay. kind of maybe soporific to me when I was a kid. And then once I grew up, I was like, oh, no, this show rocks, too. Like, now, I, now I'm, I kind of had to grow into it, I think. Um, but I think that was back, I, I think I rewatched all of Deep Space Nine right after college, like in 2005. And that's when I just got nuts. I was like, I'm going to rewatch all of it. I'm going to consume as much of it. I'm going to talk about it with my friends all the time. And uh, that's when I started writing TNG Season 8, you know, like around... Uh, 2008, I think. I'm probably getting that wrong. I could just look at Twitter, but I started writing fake episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation on Twitter, and that blew up, and that's kind of what led to Lower Decks. Great. I mean, can we talk real quick about how that developed? Because I think that's an amazing part of how this actually, you know, morphed into what you are now creating with Lower Decks. <clears throat> sure, yeah. It was, um, 
you know, I was, I was an assistant on a desk uh, for the head of animation at Fox. And I had just been a, uh, a, a PA, which is, you know, a production assistant, somebody who keeps the office stocked with printer paper and coffee on um, the show Drawn Together and on the show South Park. And so I didn't move to LA knowing that I would do animation, but I knew that I loved animated stuff. Simpsons, Futurama might be my favorite. Um, and so, you know, when you want to be a writer, you've got to write all the time. And I remember I wrote a pretty gnarly, maybe not great take on a, on a comedic version of Star Trek that didn't involve any Star Trek IP. And it was kind of based on the unspoken um, sort of like colonialist aspects of the Federation. And my manager at the time, her big note on it was, why does this have to take place in space? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> uh, okay, maybe, I, maybe this is bad. Um, and, I, and I was watching tons of, you know, I was engaged at the time to my now wife and uh, lucky how that works out. And the, um, we were, we were rewatching all of Star Trek together and just on a binge, just like loving it. And, I was, I was so desperate. I wish I could just write for a Star Trek show, but there were none on the air then. And it was driving me crazy that I couldn't do a spec script for a Star Trek. So I started writing TNG season eight. The tweets was my version of getting to write Star Trek episodes, just pretending that TNG never went away, just like forcing and willing it to just still be existing. And it was just to make, you know, a couple of my friends laugh and my wife laugh. And then it blew up. It got like 100,000 followers. I only tweeted a couple hundred times. And then uh, I was on hiatus from the show I was working on at that point. And I just wrote a letter to a, a book agent, um, a lit agent named Kate McKean, and was like, I think I can turn this, this Star Trek Twitter into a book. And so I wrote up a proposal for Simon & Schuster, and they totally got it. Uh, Ed Sletchinger over there is in charge of all the Star Trek stuff, and he totally geeked out over it. So I wrote this this book called Warped, which was a, a fake guide to the fake season of Star Trek The Next Generation, and they published it. They put it out as if it was a real guide. Um, and it, that led directly to Lower Decks because uh, a friend of mine who was an assistant that I, I met him when we were assistants at Fox, he was also an assistant in the same building, Aaron Byers, ended up becoming an executive. While I was going on the writer's track, he was going on the executive track. He ended up as an executive at Secret Hideout, which obviously makes, you know, all of this next generation of Trek. And he knew I was crazy for Star Trek. He knew I worked on Rick and Morty, which he loved. And he knew I had this book and that I knew tons about that. I just had a working, understanding love of just the world of, you know, the galaxy that the Federation inhabits. And that the, you know, he had me come in and, and, and talk to Alex Kurtzman about what my dream sort of animated show was that I never thought they were going to go for because I wanted to do a comedy and I wanted to do a 23, a 2380 era, you know, TNG era uh, show. And, and to their credit, they, I didn't have to beg or explain or, or like, or like bribe anybody. They completely got it. They got it. And, and I've been, I've been in heaven ever since I've been making Star Trek. It's awesome. And, and what's really great is, I love the fact that you you know that it's a very active community online. I mean, we've exchanged a few tweets talking about it on on, on the internet. And <laughs> as you know, the twi the Twitter sphere of Trek fans is very opinionated. In fact, I'd go as far as to say anywhere on the internet you've got Trek fans, you've got very opinionated people. So yeah. be, honest, be honest with me, Mike. Did you feel a little bit of pressure when you were putting together Lower Decks? You know, honestly, <clears throat> I mean, I did. I felt a ton of pressure because because I wanted it to be Star Trek that I would love. You know, I think that to n I, I couldn't really feel pressure about the Trek community at large because there are so many different, like Star Trek is open doors. You know, I mean, I know there's, there's always people on the internet who want to be gatekeepers to stuff. And like, I get it because I think like very deep down, if you look past all the crud, Star Trek is really important to everybody that loves it. And you protect the things that you love and you don't want people to quote unquote mess up or change or alter, you know, these things that, that are a safe haven for you that you put on in the background to keep you company or that you've seen a million times or that you've invested a lot of emotional energy into. And I totally get it. I don't want people messing with my stuff like that either. And the thing with Star Trek though, is that the, there isn't one type of Star Trek, you know, like 
TOS, TNG, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, the movies, the JJ movies, the new era, Disco and Picard, like the, the animated series, even Galaxy Quest. Like there has been, and I know Galaxy Quest isn't an official Star Trek st- thing, but like to me it was, you know, when I saw that movie, I was like, oh, I love this movie. It's a beautiful, great Star Trek movie that happens to get why Star Trek is funny. And it is a bit of a spoof, but the, you know, you're never going to please every Star Trek fan. Like there's something for everybody in Star Trek and it keeps growing. And the reason, you know, some people say that Star Trek is a genre and I've been, I've been accused of that too. But I think that the even better than that is that, is that it's many genres is that you can, you know, that TNG was an expression of, Oh, what if we take the things from TOS and we, we remix it and we expand it and we see what it's like to be futuristic for, for another generation. But then Deep Space Nine and Voyager are so fascinating because it's like Voyager's not only on a space station, but, but, but it's not even on a Federation station. I mean, it's, it's a Cardassian station. All the tech looks different and, and it's about such different stuff. And, and Voyager is clearly like not even in the Alpha Quadrant. And so what those shows, you know, I, I, I actually think every Star Trek has amazing stuff in it. And, you know, I know I'm rambling about Star Trek, which no, my wife do. would say this is the perfect <laughs> job for it. But the, uh, you know, I think like it's, it's a fool's errand to say that any series of Star Trek is bad because I think where Star Trek really lives and breathes is in its characters. And there's a reason that you can love TNG, even though Sub Rosa is in it, you know, like I can even watch Sub Rosa because I might not love the idea of, of Beverly Crusher having a romantic relationship with like a magic lantern, but I do love spending time with that crew. And I think that there hasn't been a Star Trek series where I don't love the crew and, and any quote unquote bad episode, it's still 40 minutes. I get to spend with a crew with a Starfleet crew um, or with Bajorans or, or whomever uh, <laughs> or McKee, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> So I guess like the long, the, the, the short version of that rambling is that, you know, I, I knew that no matter what I did, there were going to be people that it didn't speak to because, you know, Star Trek doesn't, Star Trek, Star Trek isn't designed to be the same every time a new creator is expressing what they love about it. And that's what I'm trying to do. Like my love of Star Trek is the kind of love where I can have a beer with my friends who are also Trekkies and argue about how great Riker is great or really great. And, (laughs) and, you know, I'm not the kind of Trekkie that knows, you know, micro details about like production codes. And, and I, sometimes I forget episode titles and, and, and eras and dates and stuff like that. But I love the characters, the stories. And so I knew that as long as this, as long as Lower Decks felt like, it had vibrant characters and it stayed true to Starfleet and to, you know, personal truths and scientific truths and, 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 and ethics and morals and, and being the best that humanity can be, then I can still have fun in it. And yeah, it's not going to please everybody, but I actually think that if you let enough episodes build up, if you think it's not going to be for you and then you check it out and just kind of let it, let it just, just run and just be a part of it. I think people will be surprised because as much as I wasn't worried about people who are kind of gatekeeping Star Trek, I did, the show is kind of for them. Like there are so many, not only references, but just like themes and, and characters and, and, and even jokes that, that really play for people that love Star Trek. So ironically, anybody who really doesn't think that they needed a Star Trek animated comedy might be the perfect audience for it. If they give it a try. I mean, what's going to be exciting about this, Mike is there's a whole new fresh audience of Star Trek fans out there that don't know they are Star Trek fans. And this could be their first contact with the franchise. Totally. Uh, And I like that. There are people that steal that. uh, It's it's great. And, and what, what I love about it is, is they're going to be able to, to see your angle of Trek. And what's an interesting thing about Lower Decks is you've, you've kind of bounced off an episode that was quite popular uh, in TNG and you've turned that 
into its its own series. So can we talk a bit more about the angle that Lower Decks hits us from? Because we're used to seeing command level sure. officers. We're used to seeing the best of the best. We're used to seeing, you know, the front uh, uh, of Starfleet, the tip of the arrow. But what are we seeing here in Lower Decks? So we're not seeing, uh, you know, honestly, we are seeing the tip of the arrow for the, okay. for the ship we're on. Uh, we're seeing, oh, uh, interesting. you know, every episode of Lower Decks, we are trying to have some element of the bridge crew involved because it's not a Star Trek episode unless there is a sci-fi of the week to me, you know, a kind of TNG sci-fi mystery sort of, or, 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 or negotiation or, or something. And that stuff is happening in Lower Decks, but our focus is on a group of four ensigns. And the, the stories are comedic and they are, they are social and emotional and they're kind of, they're kind of based in, I mean, I love the episode Lower Decks. Like the, that TNG episode really proved to me that, you know, there are so many stories and characters to be told in any one Star Trek. Like you don't have to go to a whole new space station to get more Trek. You can literally just go 10 decks down and see what's going on down there. Um, because by the way, everybody on a Starfleet ship is the best of the best. Like, oh, yeah. even if you're an ensign, you're great. You're great at your job. <laughs> You know, like there's no dumb ensign in Starfleet, especially not on not on the Enterprise. You know, yes. um, their comedic flaws are more like, "Wow, I want to do such a good job that I get in my own way all the time," or "I love sci-fi stuff and Starfleet stuff. I think it can be done better. I'm going to break the rules to you know," which is kind of what Kirk and Picard do. Janeway yeah. a little less so, but um, <laughs> you know, all the comedic kind of textural flaws of our lead. Lower Deckers, the kind of the, the, where we find the comedy, it was important to me that it's all based in existing Starfleet. That it's it's not because they're dumb or it's not because they're mean. It's because they're all hopeful and they're good at what they do and they're they're inspired. They just don't know themselves and the job well enough yet. And so Lower Decks is a comedy, but it's also kind of like watching how you become a bridge officer from the ground up. I guess after Starfleet or if you're enlisted, it's kind of like what I'm saying. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. So, um, Mike, I just want to say thank you very much. I look forward to Lower Decks. You know, the first um, animated Star Trek that we've had for years. Uh, it's going to be comedy. And, and from what I've seen you write and talk about, you know, it's going to be funny. But as you've just said, we're not treading on Star Trek. We're not disrespecting Star Trek. We're just finding the, 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 the fun in it. And we're using animation. Now, I promised uh, the audience and I threw out a tweet uh, to asking for questions for you. And I know we've only got a couple of more minutes with okay. you because we're in our best behavior. But so I might ask you these kind of quick fireish questions. So guys, Mike isn't being rude. We're on the clock. I'm making sure all management's happy because when Mike has season two and three, <laughs> I want to have him back on the show. All right. So uh, Mike, one question that is uh, first things first, we've got uh, just transcend from Newcastle has said, personally, I'd like to know how much of a fan of Trek you, uh, you are and how true is the show going to be to Trek spirit? I, I kind of feel like you've asked, answered that already, haven't you, Mike? I feel like I did it, but just to answer quickly, I'm, I designed the Cerritos literally to look like the Reliant. Like I'm, I can answer any question about, you know, where are the turbo lifts? Look, <laughs> I, I've sat with the Okudas. We had them come into the office and I poured over Elkar's design with them. Not because we had to, but because we got to. Like I am, I love Star Trek. It feels like home to me. And Lower Decks should feel both like Star Trek and like something you've never seen before. So so hopefully it's, it brings something that you didn't know you wanted. Um, yeah, I guess that answers okay. that. Great. Now, Mike, feel free to answer this question by saying you don't know the answer to this because this might not be your area, but a lot of people have tweeted and I have to ask the question. I'm from the UK and there's a lot of UK Trek fans over here. And uh, I think people have been looking at your Twitter, but they, people over the, here in the UK want to know, when can we watch it? Are you at least trying to make sure that we can watch it out here over in the UK? I want everybody in the world to be able to see this show. And I think that something the internet doesn't quite calculate into, you know, it's always a mystery. Like you're always seeing like, oh, what is, what is CBS up to? What can we, is there smoke going to be rising? What color smoke is rising from the CBS studio lot? They'll indicate CBS wants all you guys to see it too. I think that the, yes. I'm, I'm not, and I, I want to be careful here because my, I usually just go radio silent because I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn because this, this business stuff of like, the deal making is not something I'm involved in. I'm involved in making sure that a trill symbiont is called a symbiont and not a yeah. symbiote. Um, but 
from what I know, here's, here's the pieces of this I know for you guys to hold on to, is that the, there are in the works the way, a way for you guys to be able to watch it. I don't know the timeline, but the reason that you guys don't know yet is squarely because of COVID, because the timelines okay. of everything that we've been doing for production have been completely thrown out and are completely different. So stuff is actually, a lot of what we were doing unexpectedly got shifted two months earlier because we were juggling around schedules and stuff. And a lot of the different groups in, you know, in entertainment, when you shuffle that stuff around, they can't move as fast as you. My priorities were keep everybody on the show healthy, keep the show being the best as possible and get it into everybody's hands as soon as I can, because we're all fucking miserable right now. And Thank you. I did not know that doing all that stuff was going to end up having to leave UK and abroad other than Canada hanging for a minute, but it's not because we don't love you guys. And it's not because we don't want to share track with you guys. You know, Star Trek is universal. Like Star Trek is global. And the, the characters in Star Trek aren't, aren't an American set of characters. They're an earth set of characters. And you know, we want, we want everybody on the planet to be able to see this Federation show. So I get the frustration. I, I have been, I have been quiet about it only because I don't want to step on the jobs of everybody else that's trying to get it to you faster and accidentally slow it down to calm people down on Twitter. Like the thought of having CBS be like, we were about to close, but then you fucking said something. And now people have to wait an extra month because it complicated some deal or whatever. Um, but it's been in the works for a long time and I'm fine at people tweeting their frustrations at me. I get it. I've been frustrated at deal making a million times before, but my priority is that you guys get it as soon as possible. So I know it's frustrating and it really is a symptom of our whole timeline moved up. Like I think, you know, we were not expecting to premiere this soon, but because of circumstances at being what they are, it was important to us to get it out in the world and we had the ability to do it safely. But yeah, the unintended consequence being you guys are having to see us all being pumped about it. <laughs> and then you're like, hello, <laughs> what yeah. about us over here? But I, trust me, it's a priority that you guys get it and we're working on it. I'm excited. I'm, I'm ready to, to get my eyes in. And whoever, wh- whoever is dist- distributing out here, my days, I hope they got the bandwidth ready because there's going to be a lot of fans checking it out. Um, <laughs> how important is it for you to kind of engage when you do talk with the Trek audience online as well? Because thank you for answering those questions from the guys that, that, that you know, that, that wrote in on Twitter. But you're also, I've seen you're quite active on Twitter at having conversations with the Trek community. I mean, I love Star Trek and I love, I, you know, sometimes I feel like I've been on the other side of it for a long time where you're like, Ooh, how, what is, what was the thinking behind this? Or why is the show taking a long time or any of that stuff? I mean, you know, it's the reason that I got into making TV isn't to keep people from knowing how to make TV. You know what I mean? It isn't, it isn't to be like a gatekeeper or a threshold guardian. Um, So I do like, you know, I mean, I'm a nerd that got behind the scenes. So like, I like to jump online with people and be like, actually, here's what happened, you know, like, and just geek out over it. Um, and I also just like talking about Star Trek and I, all the Star Trek fans I talk to, I've been talking to on there or I've been following or I've been interacting with in some capacity far before I created Lower Decks, you know, like it's just, I don't know. I'm just a, I'm just a geeky guy. And I like, I like talking about the stuff that I like. And I, I've even been accused by other uh, people on shows I work on, on being a fanboy for our own show. Like I was <laughs> such a fanboy for Rick and Morty working on it. I loved doing it. Yeah. And the other writers kind of rolled their eyes at me. One of them used to call me a ray of sunshine. <laughs> and but like, you know, in this industry, it's, you know, when you're working in TV or in movies, a lot of the times, like, you know, you don't work on the show that you want to work on. Like a lot of the times it is a job, you know, and you, you want to do your best for a show that maybe isn't as good as you would have wanted it to be. And and you're doing your best to make it that when you're writing it, like your job as a writer is to like express the voice of the showrunner and the show creator, but in a better way and in a more textured way that you can bring to it. And I, you know, I've been really, really lucky because Rick and Morty Solar Opposites and Lower Decks are all fucking awesome shows. And I've loved working on them. They're always fun. Like we all have a blast doing it. And I'm, I'm just really, you know, because just like on anything else that you would geek out over, since I'm, since I'm geeking out over the shows I'm working on, of course I want to do it online with, with Star Trek fans. 
Thank you, man. Uh, you know, and on that note, I've, I've actually got another question that's popped in on Twitter. There's loads coming in, Mike. It's crazy. But <laughs> <laughs> here's one from, from, from Mecco slash JP, Trekking JP from Canada on Twitter. They said, what is the threshold, lol, aboard the ship where you're no longer considered lower decks? So I think they're fishing for some details about the ship here. I think lower decks uh, is a mentality. I think that some people love being lower decks, you know, and and they're just happy to be there and they're excited yeah. and other people can't wait to be on the bridge. You know, I think some people would define it as us versus them. It's the, it's the crew of the ship and then there's the bridge crew, you know, <laughs> yeah. they're the people that get the best conference rooms. They're the people that get to choose who goes on away missions. You know, they're the ones who get their name on a plaque for like, for saving the day. Um, but that being said, I think being on a Starfleet ship at all, is is a major accomplishment and it really to each character and to each individual the idea of being lower decks is different you know um mm. and we've seen ensigns like look at ensign harry kim he got to take over the bridge all the time like <laughs> lower decks is what you make of it yeah yeah well bless kim never never really promoted but you know he was he was there i mean pr promote, promote by experience he should have been but i guess when you're not Modern in the right heart i bet he wrote a great book when he got back yeah exactly <laughs> There you go. Um, another question, and this is kind of coming from a few people as well, um, and, and I do want to know this as well. In terms of where you time, where, in the timeline, where you put Lower Decks as well, what was your reasoning behind that? Oh, yeah. I mean, the reason was I, I, I tricked everybody into giving me a Star Trek show, and I wanted to do a TNG era show, but I didn't want to do anything that messed up the TNG era shows that I like because I'm yeah. doing new stories. Yeah. So I slipped in right after Nemesis, just like right there in 2380, there's like a four or five year gap where nothing in the timeline really happens. And, and, and now there is. So, you know, all of our star dates are, are applied to Canon. Like if you, if you put our, our episodes on the timeline of Canon, we don't mess anything up. Nobody's, Nobody's uh, going back in time and, and, and kicking Khan <laughs> in the butt or anything like that yet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, but, but really, I mean, the real answer is because that it was important to me that we did a as close to canon as possible Star Trek show, but in the TNG era, because that's, that's my jam. Like, I just love that era. Great. You, you know, you've also left yourself open to some um, cameo appearances. I mean, because people can lend yes. their voice. It, you know, a few, a few of our, our known Trekkie actors have been in animations before. So Patrick Stewart isn't afraid mm -hmm. of stepping into the vocal booth. So is that something that you're all very aware of as well in your studios that, you know, you're in the right timeline for oh, people yeah. to be able to step in? I mean, practically the entire TNG cast was on the show Gargoyles forever. Like they're all <laughs> pros. They know how to do voice acting. Yeah. Um, uh, first season of Lower Decks, uh, there are a couple awesome cameos. And I mean, I, I can't, if you had a Star Trek show, wouldn't you be finding reasons to, to bring in some legacy actors? Like, come on, get out of town. Um, and uh, on top of that, um, you know, it's just that we, it doesn't happen all the time. When it happens, it's really special. Not only because it's special to work with those guys, but also because this isn't the Enterprise. It's the Cerritos. So, like, why would somebody from the Enterprise end up crossing paths with them? It has to make sense in the story that we're telling. Um, so that was important to me. And then, you know, I don't know if we touched on this earlier, but I've already written second season. Like, we've written second season, and we're working on it right now. I'm actually – all right, that was a lie. I'm writing the finale right now, but I know what happens. So, okay. you know – there's a lot of fun to be had second season. And I think first season we kind of get our footing like pretty quickly and second season is just a party. We have an awesome time. So, you know, there's room in both seasons um, for some, for some faces you might recognize. Awesome. Took the, took the words right out of my mouth there with those questions too. And in terms of uh, another thing the Trek community will be interested in is there's two ways that things can go. I mean, we're used to episodic content and we're also used to kind of, overarching storylines and then hybrids over the years as well. I mean, where are we going with that, Mike? What, what do you want to tell us about that? Because you're in season two now, so that's made me think, you know, what, yeah. what, what are you going to leave us with that's going to carry over <laughs> and such? Uh, the prevailing storytelling kind of mechanism of Lower Decks is episodic, is that every episode that you turn on, you're going to get a beginning, middle, and end. You're going to get new emotional stories, new sci-fi stories, new comedy stories. But... You know, we're in the golden age of television, uh, which means, and, and, and part of the freedom of 
getting to do this on CBS All Access is that for a new viewer who logs in, I know that they're going to have access to every episode that we've done. It's not like they're going to hope that their buddy has a VHS. <laughs> so there are uh, through lines that will be happening across, across first season that then also you'll see, you'll see some season long stuff that lands in the finale of first season, but you'll also see a lot of stuff that carries from first over into second, especially the finale. I really love the finale. Like I would say if there's any episode to watch live to not, to not get spoiled for it. The last, the last four episodes you're going to want to see live, but the, if you have to choose one, the finale is don't miss that one, you know, okay. make sure to be caught up for that one. All right, then we'll, we'll be over it. I'll have to get, fly myself over to the States and, and make sure that I've got my, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, my subscription set up. I just went up. on so long about how we're trying to get you guys <laughs> that stuff. No, but it's all good, man. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. I mean, no, no, nah, nah, it's all look, I'm you know what? I, there's two ways to be about something. You can be upset or you can look forward to it. And I was the kid, and I am the kid that looks forward to it. I'm excited that I'm gonna go to Disneyland. I'm excited I'm gonna see New Trek. I'm excited when it's you know, when we're gonna have some fried chicken for dinner. Hey, I, I get excited about these things. I get me, I don't I don't get upset because I'm not having them. I look forward to them. Um another thing, I mean you mentioned it a couple of times, uh, the ship, like what what kind of what kind of what, what do you want to tell us about the ship as well because everyone's talking about it. everyone's been looking at pictures been analyzing it where are the nacelles what's happening um and and i think you kind of alluded to this earlier on you know because uh, it's lower decks i i i i said well you know the ship is it going to be like you know the tip of, tip of the spear is it going to be and you've actually said to me that the ship's actually all right or is it in good condition or where does it stand in starfleet <laughs> Uh, the ship is in great condition. It's a California class ship, which has always existed in Starfleet is what we're saying that they're nice. the, uh, the utility support ships in the California class. There's three types of hull painting. There's blue, red, and yellow. We've extended the visual metaphor of the uniforms to the ships. The Cerritos has yellow on the hull because it's literally a primarily second contact engineering ship. They cool. show up to planets that need engineering stuff done on them in order to be able to communicate with the Federation. Um, yeah. There's also, you'll see in the show, blue hauled uh, 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 California class ships, which are usually deployed for places where there has to be more medical expertise and red hauled ships that have red paint on them that are like for moving around ambassadors and doing more kind of like command level stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the actual design of the, of the Cerritos, which is our lead ship, um, is directly inspired by my favorite Starfleet ship, uh, which is the Reliant uh, from Wrath of Khan. And, yeah. and I just love... The look of that ship, it's like, it's, it's, I wanted to take the Reliant and then put it into sort of a, a version of, of the next gen sort of look of ships. And then on top of that, you know, it's a support ship. It can't look as cool as all the other ships. Uh, it can't be as easy to get around in it. You know, I'm surprised by how many people I saw online were like, well, wait a minute, but engineering section is removed and put in between the, the nacelles. How do you get to it? And it's like, mm-hmm. guys, there were diagonal elevators for turbo lifts, <laughs> excuse me, in the Enterprise D. Like, have you guys not been looking at the schematics <laughs> of the Enterprise D? Because we have been. Also, as my, my wife saw some of those tweets and rolled her eyes and said, why are they not knowing that there's diagonal turbo lifts in this ship? There's diagonal elevators at the Luxor in Vegas. They think the Luxor has better <laughs> technology than a Starfleet ship. Uh, you know, we, if there's, Listen, I love the internet. It's a million minds. It's a, it's a hive mind, you know, where everybody who knows more than me is all getting together and, and trying to kind of like make sure that everything is kind of stress checked, you know? Yeah, man. But when it comes to the ship, we have many hundreds of designs of the ship that we whittled down to exactly what I wanted. Like I wanted the nacelles to be shaped more squarely than I wanted the kind of smooth lines of, of the Enterprises, uh, Enterprise D's nacelles. And I also didn't want it to look like you know, I didn't want it to look NX class where it was like kind of all funky and early. And I also didn't want it to look, you know, like a sovereign class, which was all fancy and and shiny. Like I wanted it to look a little bit more like a standard, you know, season four, season five TNG era ship. Um, And so it has fewer decks, but it, you know, it's still, it's still a fully functioning Starfleet ship. It has a full crew. And uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but we do visit some parts of the ship that we've always heard about that we've never seen before. Oh, and I think that's an amazing place to leave it. Not because I want to, Mike. It's because I'm going to get in trouble with the whole team that's actually hooked up. This <laughs> so, that's okay. Um, I just want to say, man, um, we're very, very excited over here in the UK, and I'm sure I can speak for the rest of the world 
there's a lot of very excited people ready to see some new Trek. Um, man, thank you for all the information you gave us today. And I just hope you get to enjoy seeing what the internet makes of <laughs> and the world makes of, of Lower Decks, man. And, and thank you very much for having a chat with us, Mike. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so excited for you guys to get to see it. And, and I, I, I won't rest until all 10 episodes are out because that'll be when the real conversation happens so Good i'm really stuff. excited thank well, you. you you know i'll be talking about it over at trek culture as well so you know we we we, we give it some good some good light I'll over there as well there. <laughs> all right man so thank I you very much it. have a good one i'll let you get to it mike <laughs> so there you go there's our chat with mike man i'm so excited at this time of recording billy we are two days away from the world being exposed to lower decks i mean i really enjoyed that and you i mean I've, I'll admit, I'm not a Trekkie myself. I've never watched Star Trek, but I think I'll, uh, as soon as it's available in the UK, I'll, uh, I think I'll slap that on and, and have a watch. Sounds, sounds really interesting. I mean, like I said to him, like Trek, ev- everyone's first experience, every Trekkie had a first experience with Trek and they didn't necessarily, and Mike said it as well, his entry point was TNG, it, the next generation. It wasn't the first ever episode. So his experience was Captain Picard, you know, Jean-Luc Picard, Patrick Stewart, not Captain Kirk and some people may just be coming into Trek and their first experience of Star Trek might actually be an animated series which is made in the year 2020 which is interesting and do you know what I think what really came across is his passion he's passionate yeah. and he loves Star Trek so whatever he's creating for us is coming from a loving place like and I feel like so when someone's got passion like that behind a project I, I feel like they're gonna they're really gonna put their all into making sure that we enjoy it as a show do you get me? Definitely. We see, you can tell when things are done with passion and when things are just honed in. So if yeah, it's done with passion, it's going to be, it's going to be really good and you can better watch it and enjoy it. And yeah, yeah. I'm sure you, you as a Trekkie is going to be all over it. Right. This could have you look, listen, if you're a fan of Rick and Morty, yeah, you're a fan of polar opposites is another thing that Mike's behind. As solar well. opposites. Uh, solar opposites, even <laughs> polar opposites. Solar opposites is another thing Mike's behind, which I've actually started getting into actually as well. Um, then bruv, this could be a bit of you, you know, Bill. It could be a bit, you could be a Trekkie. You could be, I could see you wearing a com badge soon. I could see you throwing up a little live long and prosper bill, a kapla. Can you do it? Oh, you can do it. You can do it. You can do the, you can do the finger scissor. But, um, yes. Anyway, um, there's plenty of ways to kill some time out there. Thank you for killing some time with us. Um, and yeah, man, stick around. We're definitely going to be covering Lower Decks and its impact in the future. And I definitely want to get Mike on the show again. And I feel like I want to have a proper long chat with him, man. Um, you can find us at How to Kill an Hour on all social medias. I'm at Marcus B R O N Z Y. Plenty of ways to kill some time out there. Thank you for killing some time with us. Bless.